evening. This is John Milburn for Laws 13010, Evidence and Proof. We're into week nine. We're still dealing with issues to do with hearsay, and um, the topic for tonight is other exceptions to the hearsay rule. So hearsay, of course, is um, something which is almost treated in the exception more than the rule. Um, there are so many exceptions to the rule that uh, it might in fact be easier if we said, look, hearsay evidence is allowed unless there are certain exceptions to it rather than the other way around. Anyway, hearsay is essentially something which is sought to be produced in evidence, which is to prove uh, that something said by another person typically is true. And of course, that's not allowed under our rules. So that would technically be hearsay. But there are many exceptions to that. So tonight we're dealing with some of those exceptions. So the first thing is to clearly understand what we mean by hearsay evidence. We can't really talk about an exception to the rule unless we know what the rule is. So hearsay evidence is something which is tended as truth of the facts asserted. So the question is this, is the evidence which is tended trying to establish that what is said by the other person, if you like the third party typically, is actually true. So let's think back to the subramanium case. In that case, the evidence led by defence was to the effect that Mr. Subramanium had been threatened, as I recall, by Chinese nationalists. The immediate objection was, you can't lead that evidence, that's hearsay evidence. You are trying to introduce into the court something that was said by a third party. If you want that evidence led, bring in the third party. Now that leads us to this first question, the threshold question. Was the evidence that Mr. Subramanian's legal team trying to introduce tended as truth of the facts that were stated by the third party? And the answer is no. What they were trying to establish is that the words were said and that had a bearing on the mind of Subramanian. It, he wasn't trying to establish that the threats made, um, which were effectively cooperate with us, do what we want, otherwise we will kill you, and we are Chinese um, communists, terrorists. Uh, we weren't trying to establish that these people by saying we are Chinese communist terrorists was actually true. In a way, it doesn't matter. What we were trying to say is the words were said and this affected our state of mind. So we have this distinction, number one, between evidence which is introduced for a hearsay purpose or a non-hearsay purpose. Sounds a bit artificial, but that's a key to it. So that's the first question, and it really comes down to, the, to this issue of, are we trying to tend to this evidence, which is hearsay evidence, as truth of the facts is asserted or not? If the answer is no, then the assertion is outside the ambit of hearsay prohibition. If the answer is yes, we are trying to tend to this hearsay evidence as truth of what is asserted by way of fact within that statement, then the question is, does the assertion fail, uh, fall within the exception, common law or statutory, to the prohibition against leading hearsay evidence? And if the answer is yes, the assertion will be admitted, provided it is not um, it is otherwise legally admissible and it is not excluded as a matter of discretion. <clears throat> a whole lot of different rules, aren't there? A whole lot of different questions. So as I mentioned, I think last week, it would be appropriate for you to try to work out your own flowchart, work out your own questions so that you've got a clear idea of where these things flow. Now, here's the problem. When it comes to the examination, you'll be under time pressure. Odds are there'll be a question about hearsay. And you need to identify the rule, what is hearsay? 
what is the rule against the tendering of hearsay when we're trying to establish the truth of the facts as asserted in the hearsay statement? What are the exceptions to the rule? And then we have to think about uh, whether there are issues to do with discretion and admissibility generally. So for yourself, try to plot out a plan that works well. That's for the examination. But let's think about this issue of what is hearsay and what are the exceptions of the hearsay rule in practice. Place yourself now in a situation where you're in a trial. You need to object to an opponent's witness to what an opponent's witness has said or what you anticipate an opponent's witness is about to say. How do you mount the objection? When do you mount when do you mount the objection? So if your opponent objects to evidence that your witness has led or is about to lead, about to lead, how do you respond to that objection? And if you are concerned that your, your witness is about to um, provide inadmissible evidence, what do you do about it? Do you need to be proactive? What are your duties to the court, to the client, the administration of justice? In other words, is there a rule that says that when you're in the process of leading evidence, that you just let it all go through unless the opponent objects? Or do you have obligations as well? So when you're reading the material about hearsay, when you're preparing your flow charts, we, when you're preparing the information about whether something is hearsay, whether it fits within the exceptions to the hearsay rule, I'd like you to think about it in the context of the examination and the time pressure that you'll be under, which is real, but it's not intense. And then take it one step further and think, how will I work this in practice if I'm in a trial and I need to mount an objection or deal with an objection or deal with a situation that you can see is going to happen and think about your ethical obligations. So if you put yourself under that pressure while you're reading the material, it will make the examination so much easier. I hope that makes sense and I don't mean to scare you by that statement. So if you're watching this as a recorded session, I'd pause, think about what I'm saying and then work something that uh, works for you. Now, those of you that have worked with me in the past, you know that I've suggested of part of the assessment say in statutory interpretation has been to prepare a toolkit. Same thing in introduction to law. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that you expand your toolkit now to provide yourself with clear guidance as to hearsay and the exceptions about hearsay, how you'll deal with it in the exam and how you'll deal with it in practice. So this week we're talking about some of the exceptions to the hearsay rule. We've already talked about some. Last week we talked about confessions and admissions, but now we're talking about other things. Um, and, but I just want to expand on, before I go into those exceptions, just expand on this concept of objecting or dealing with objections in a trial sense. Hi, Samantha, did you have a question? No, uh -huh. sorry, I accidentally no, pressed up. All right, you're welcome to, to ask questions. Questions are good. Vivian, no questions at this stage? All right, good. And I've made a promise to Vivian and Samantha, they're very good in attending every week they turn up. Those of you that are in the uh, unit and you're not attending, please consider doing it. But I say the same thing every week. Um, so the rule that I have with Vivian and Samantha is I'm not going to pick on them. If we had 10 in the unit um, for the live session, I'd be asking a lot of questions and, and, and inviting people to provide responses. But it's not fair when we've only got two. Okay, so let's go back to, I guess, a central theme of what I'm trying to promote tonight. And that is how you might go about undertaking your study in relation to hearsay within the context of the exam and a trial. So let's look at it at a trial. So, and the objections. I know we're going off topic a bit, but the idea is that you put yourself in that position, in that mindset. We're in a trial and there are issues to do with objecting. 
If you object, you might be objecting to many things. You might be objecting to the way in which your opponent asks a question. You might be objecting to the content of the question that your opponent asks. Or you may object to the content of the evidence given by a witness. Does that make sense? So we're not just talking about hearsay. Hearsay is an important part of it. And it's a very common issue to do with objections. But I'm sort of looking at the broader issue now. So let's think about what you might do in terms of objecting to questions. You might object to the frequency of questioning. You might object because it's unethical questioning. It might be that you object because your opponent is asking leading questions. Or you might object <clears throat> because your opponent seeks from a witness an opinion that is inappropriate because that person is not, say, for an example, an expert. Or you might be objecting because the questioning is generally improper. Was that prohibition about asking improper questions? You might object because your opponent is asking argumentative questions or speculative questions. So do you see where I'm going with this? What I'm inviting you to do is just expand on your toolkit by have a list of single words, for example, that you can have before you, um, not necessarily just for the trial that you're in or just for the examination that you're in, but for general use. You carry it with you every time you go to a trial. And you have that there ready to go so that as a question is asked, you think that doesn't sound right. You scan down your list quickly. It's argumentative, argumentative, objection, argumentative. Do you understand what I'm getting at? So let's go back to our list. Speculative questions I mentioned. It may be that the question just doesn't seem right because it assumes a fact not yet in evidence. Objection. The question assumes a fact not in evidence, Your Honour. Sit down. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Because when you object, it's got to be immediate and it's got to be straight to the point. Objection leading. Objection speculative. Objection question assuming a fact not in evidence. Other things, irrelevant question. Objection irrelevant. Um, it might be oppressive questioning. Okay, so having a list of, of, of key words that you might use as part of an objection to questioning would be a useful thing and tie that in if you can with this issue about hearsay. I'll just go on a bit more. I mentioned that your objections might be in relation to questions asked by your opponent, but it might be that your objection relates to the content of the evidence given by the witness. So let's explore that. The first one, number A, is hearsay. Um, objection, hearsay. Now, just that's where we're, that, so tonight we're talking about hearsay, we're talking about exceptions to the hearsay evidence, but I just want to put this within the context of generally objecting. Because if you're going to object to hearsay evidence, it's one of a, a range of objections that you might make. But the point is that you need to know it immediately and be able to object to it immediately. What other things might you object to for a witness? Opinion evidence. Prejudicial evidence. That's a tougher one. But bear in mind that evidence is only admissible if it is probative and not and the prejudice does not um, you know, uh, outweigh the, the probative value. So if you believe that the prejudice does outweigh the probative value, you've got to object, and the appropriate objection is objection prejudicial evidence. Now, the court may stop you and may say, look, let's um, the witness out of the witness box outside and we'll have a legal argument in the absence of, of the witness, but you've got to raise that objection. Uh, other objections about the witness evidence might be that it's character evidence, that it's evidence about privileged information, 
It's an unresponsive answer. It's a volunteered answer. That is, it doesn't relate to the question. You know, it's just something that they've thrown in. Um, objection, speech making. You know, it's got to be confined to the matter of issues in substance. The facts, it's not there. The witness box is not a platform for someone to get on their soapbox and enter into a speech. Um, objection, speculative answer, or it may be you object because it's an unintelligible response, or it may be you object because it's an irrelevant response. There's a whole range of things that you might do. Okay, so one of those, a very important one, number one is hearsay, but it's a whole range of things that you might object to. Now, of course, if you're leading evidence, your opponent may object about the question that you ask or the nature of the question that you ask or the manner of your questioning. So you need to be prepared to stop your own witness if your witness is about to breach or has breached a rule about proffering inadmissible evidence during a trial. In other words, prevention is better than cure. You want to prevent a situation occurring, which if you didn't allow, if you didn't stop it, would give rise for your opponent to object or even worse still for the court to intervene. But if your opponent does object, um, just be ready to argue the toss. Your witness is giving evidence. You think it's fine. It's good evidence. Um, witness says, and I heard, I heard uh, this person say these words, X, Y, Z. Objection, hearsay. What do you say about that, Ms. Forsyth? What do you say about that, Ms. Pam? Your Honour, my submission, it's not hearsay because I'm introducing the evidence not to establish the truth of the statement being made, but simply for a non-hearsay purpose, and that is to establish that the words were said and it had an impact on the mind of my witness. Do you understand? So you've got to, you've got to know the rules pretty quickly. Okay, um, but I'm not, I don't mean to scare you, but just to ask you to prepare. And preparing means more than just reading the text. Preparing means reading actively, considering the material critically, and really importantly, putting it in a form that works for you. Okay, so let's, let's try to work on the basis that we're um, teaching you not just something for restatement during an examination, but something you can actually use. It's meant to be a practical course. Okay, so you can't meaningfully object um, to, to evidence, which is hearsay evidence, unless you have a very clear un understanding of what the rule is and what the exceptions to that rule might be. So generally speaking, um, hearsay is based on trying to stop something which is being said <clears throat> outside of court in circumstances where it was not said under oath. Typically, it's you repeating what somebody else said, but it might actually be something that you said previously as well. Now, there is a general rule. There's a rule about uh, not being able to lead evidence of prior consistent statements. So that's not really hearsay, but it kind of is. So do you understand what I mean by a prior consistent statement? Okay, let, let me say this. Put it this way. <clears throat> Picture you're in <coughs> the witness box and you are giving evidence about what you actually said at an occasion, at a particular occasion. And I, sa I said to him that I am rescinding the contract. Now, they're words that you're saying in evidence about what was actually said. But what if you then said, um, and I told Jim Brown yesterday at the pub these words that I said at, at the event. So if you're just simply repeating something that you had said <coughs> out of court to somebody else, 
which is consistent with what you're saying in court now. You can't bolster your credibility by saying, um, not only did I say it at the time, and I'm saying it here in court, but I've, to I've, said, I've said this to 10 people over the last week. Sorry, my voice is going. Sorry, I'll just mute for a sec. I don't know about you, but towards the end of the day, my after talking all day, the voice just starts to go. Um, so my apologies for that. Anyway, the point is that it doesn't matter uh, that you've said something 20 times to different people at different pubs over the last two weeks. It's irrelevant. There's no, you, can't, you can't admit into evidence some prior consistent statement because um, that doesn't help the situation. It doesn't matter how many times you'd say it. And that's actually part of the reason why we have the hearsay rule, isn't it? Because if we allowed on all occasions first-hand hearsay, we run the risk of having a procession of witnesses who go into the witness box and all, all they say is, Jim Brown told me this and this is what he said. And if you have 100 people saying the same thing, all of every one of which is um, hearsay evidence, just through the sheer weight of numbers, you get to a situation where people might start to think, gosh, he told 100 people. Now, 100 people have come along and said, this is what he said. It's starting to sound awfully like it's true, but all it is is hearsay. I hope that makes some sense. Okay, so <clears throat> let's think about the, que the question of objections more specifically within the context of the rules of hearsay evidence. So number one is, um, what do you say to an objection? Someone says, objection, hearsay evidence. The first thing that you might say in response to that is, this evidence is not hearsay evidence. This is evidence from the witness's own five senses. That's, that's the best counter, isn't it? The second is, <clears throat> you might say, the evidence is hearsay evidence, conceded, but the evidence is not tendered as truth of the facts is asserted. Why? because the evidence goes to establish the state of mind of the maker or the evidence goes to, a state, uh, to establish the state of the mind of the recipient. Okay. Um, I'll come back and give some examples on that. Number three, you've got an objection from your opponent hearsay evidence and you, basically you, you run this argument the evidence is hearsay evidence. It is tendered as to the truth of the facts as asserted, but it falls within a statutory exception that is a statutory exception to the prohibition against leading hearsay evidence. I'll come back to that as well. Can you see that I'm building a progression here? I know it's tough, but try and work with me if you can. That's number three. Number four, your opponent objects hearsay. And in response, you say, the evidence is hearsay evidence. It is tendered as, tr as truth of the facts is asserted, but it falls within a common law exception, that is, to the prohibition against leading hearsay evidence. Three and four are basically the same, but number three is saying, it is hearsay, it is tended as truth of the facts asserted, but there is a statutory exception to the prohibition. That's number three. Number four is, it is hearsay evidence, it is tended as to truth of the uh, facts as asserted, but it falls within a common law exception to the prohibition against leading hearsay evidence. And number five is, just concede the point, give up and don't lead the evidence. So they're kind of the basic responses that you might have <clears throat> if you're challenged in court by your opponent on the basis that 
what your witness is saying is hearsay evidence. So if you're going to run those arguments, you need to be aware of what the rule about hearsay is. You need to understand what is here, what it, what it is, um, the evidence uh, which is tended for a hearsay or a non-hearsay purpose. You need to understand the statutory exceptions. You need to understand the common law exceptions. Um, I just I mentioned that I'll go back to, to number two. Number two was to say, all right, objection, hearsay. You stand up and you say, yes, the evidence is hearsay evidence, but it is not tendered as to the truth of the facts as asserted. Two parts. Number one, the evidence goes to establish the state of mind of the maker. Number two, the evidence goes to establish the state of mind of the recipient. Now, I'm sure you both know the case, the leading case that you would quote if you're talking about establishing the state of mind of the recipient. Samantha knows this one. I do. Is it Bull v Queen for a recipient? Ah, think about it. Oh, subramanian. Correct. Sorry, right. I've got both of them down. <laughs> yeah. Yes, very good. Which means you have already answered the question for the first one which is a good case to show that the evidence goes to establish the state of mind of the maker. So Samantha, which one would that be? I had Walton v Queen for um, state of mind of the maker. Yeah, Walton works, but Bull is, is oh, an Bull. Bull, okay. Bull against the Queen is an excellent example to show that exception. So, <clears throat> In your study guides, there are some really good little summaries of these cases, aren't there? So let's, have I written, actually, I have got some. I, let me just have a look. Okay, so just a refresher. Bull against the Queen. This is straight from the study guide. Let me just read it. Um, Bull against the Queen. Bull went to a friend's house. The friend and some males were charged with sexual crimes against her. And the contents of an earlier email in which it was implied she would attend for group sex was admitted to show her state of mind. Okay, it's not exactly as I recall it, but um, it was a telephone call, wasn't it? <coughs> and um, the evidence is, look, this is what she, um, this is what was said. It's, it's hearsay, but it's admissible because it goes to show the state of mind of the recipient, which was, which was the complainant. Okay. Now, what was the other one that you mentioned, Samantha? You mentioned Walton, didn't you? Yeah, Walton v. The Queen. That was an essay case. Yes. Can you just remind me of Walton? Yeah, it's um, where there was four, they submitted four corroborating uh, witness statements around, three were around knowing that the person was going to meet at the shopping centre and the last one was a phone call where the child said, hi, daddy. That's it, yes. Okay. Um, was that Western Australia or South Australia? It was South Australia, wasn't it, at Elizabeth? Yep, South Australia, That's yep. Right. That's right. Uh, so there was that phone call and it's a case which, they, which relates to the assumed state of mind of, I think, the maker. Okay. So I guess what we're trying to emphasise, and thank you very much for that, Samantha, that was great. But what we're trying to emphasise is that it's a good idea to state a principle and just even if you have one case that you can cite as an example, as an authority, that would be excellent. So have a list, have a little flow chart, whatever works for you, state the principle, and then have one case. You can have a couple if you like, but try not to confuse it too much. Because in an exam setting, if you state the principle and you have one case to back it up, odds are you're going to do very well. You know, you're not going to gain a lot more by having necessarily two cases. One's enough. Does that make sense? So good work, Samantha. That was great. All right. Um, so whatever the principle is, and you might use the same case as authority for a number of principles. So I'm just looking at some notes that I've, let me just have a look at some notes here. Oh yeah, so Pollock, we talked about Pollock last week, which might be, 
um, a case that re relates to the state of knowledge of a previous event. So have the, have the phrase, have the case, and you can work the same case in for a number of different reasons. All right, so that's excellent. So I think we dealt with those cases under the concept of um, confessions and admissions last week. Um, all right, so I think what I'd recommend that you do is have a look at the study guides, have a look at the, the cases that are referred to, and you might even be able to work it in reverse. What is this case? How can I use it as authority for a certain principle? Uh, there may be others. Now, I mentioned that you need to be aware of the exceptions at common law and under statute. It goes a little bit further than that, doesn't it? Common law is common law, but statute is necessary, is going to be one of two things, isn't it? It'll either be under the Queensland position or it'll be under the Uniform um, Evidence Act, common law. So you need, when we talk about statute, you're going to have to have two different branches and they can be different. So, um, and they can be different for oral evidence as opposed to written, you know, documentary evidence and they can be different for civil and criminal. So in fact, even though we're talking about statutory exceptions, you may end up with six branches of statutory exceptions. Queensland, Commonwealth, oral, written. Oh, maybe that's four, but you know, you, you get the idea. Um, and the information or the law in relation to the Commonwealth position can be substantially different to the law that applies under the Queensland Evidence Act. Now, look, a really good example of that, I think one that really stands out for me, and if you're asked to, to give an example of how the law relating to hearsay at the Commonwealth levels differs from the law relating to hearsay as it applies under the Queensland Act, a really good example of that, I think, would be to, to talk about the effect of Section 60 of the, the Uniform Act. So Section 60, I've got it here, deals with the issue of exceptions to the hearsay rule. So I'm talking about the Uniform Evidence Act, the Commonwealth Act 1995. So Section 60 deals with exception to the hearsay rule evidence relevant for a non-hearsay purpose. Number one, the hearsay rule does not apply to evidence of a previous representation that is admitted because it is relevant for a purpose other than proof of an asserted fact. Um, so what does section 60 actually mean in practice? Well, it has this effect. A number of times tonight and previously we've talked about subramanium. And the reason I mentioned subramanium is <clears throat> it really does illustrate very well the distinction between hearsay evidence used for a hearsay purpose as opposed to hearsay evidence used for a non-hearsay purpose. I think we all know what, what I'm talking about here. But here's the kick. With Section 60 of the Commonwealth Act, the Evidence Act, if as a prosecutor, you can get some evidence in for a non-hearsay purpose. Once it's in, it's in for any purpose. And that's the tricky bit. This is the tricky bit. Um, and this, this doesn't apply for Queensland Evidence Act, but it does apply for the Uniform Evidence Act. So if you can get something in on the basis that it's for a non-hearsay purpose, once it's in there, it's fair game. You can use it for anything you like. I know that sounds odd. So um, it's, uh, and the rationale is this. You know how it's difficult to really understand this dis distinction between hearsay for hearsay purposes, non-hearsay purposes, subramanium. Let's, let's assume this situation. Subramanium, the evidence goes in, this is what they said to me. They said to me, we are Chinese communist terrorists. Do what we say, otherwise we will kill you. 
that evidence goes in. The justification is for it's a non-hearsay purpose. Fine. We're going to the witness, but we're going to the jury now. Well, let's just put ourselves into the jury room. We're not allowed to go in there, but let's just assume we're going there. Can you imagine the discussions that are going on? Um, someone says, well, they were Chinese communist terrorists, weren't they? And another person who's been listening very carefully to the court says, well, yes, but we can't take that evidence as evidence of the fact that they were in fact Chinese communist terrorists. And the other witness says, yeah, but I heard them say that. That was the evidence they said. You're telling me that I can't use that as evidence that they were in fact Chinese communist terrorists? Yes, because the judge explained to us that we can only use that evidence that we've heard to consider it in the context of the state of mind of the recipient. We can't accept it as evidence as to truth of the allegations of fact contained within that statement. The other 11 jurors who haven't been listening carefully and don't know their evidence law very, very well are going, I don't understand what you mean. It's, a, it's in there as evidence. We heard them say that they're Chinese communist terrorists. I don't get it. I hope I've explained that well enough. But the point that I'm trying to make is it's almost a concession. Parliament have all, almost conceded at a Commonwealth level by Section 60 this fact. Once it's in, we really can't be telling the jury that you can use it for this purpose, but you can't use it for that purpose. Once it's in, the jury can consider it for any purpose. Hearsay, non-hearsay purpose, it doesn't matter. Once it's in, it's in. So that's a really big difference between the Commonwealth and the state jurisdictions as far as um, the hearsay and non-hearsay use of evidence is concerned. I hope I haven't confused you too much. Does that make some sense? All right. If you're listening to this recorded session later, go and have a look carefully at Section 60 of the Commonwealth Act and see if you can work through that um, uh, issue. All right, now there are a whole lot of things. Run at time is really running out. I'm rambling, I'm sorry. But there are a whole lot of other things. Common law exceptions. A big one relates to statements of deceased persons and evidence which is otherwise hearsay evidence may be admitted as an exception to the uh, hearsay rule at common law in certain circumstances. For example, if they'd been competent if they were alive. The statements might be admissible if the person making the statement would have been a competent witness um, had they been alive at the time. If the declaration was against their interest. So Bannon against the Crown <coughs> cites that um, old rule that it suggests that it survived into modern times. Another one is statements made by a person pursuant to a duty. So a person who has deceased is otherwise a competent witness, um, if they would have been a competent witness had they been alive, and they made a statement pursuant to a duty. That's admissible as to the truth of the matters contained within the um, statement, even though it's otherwise hearsay. But they have to actually have made the, the statement pursuant to a duty, not in the course of their duties, but pursuant to a duty. They're under a positive obligation to make that statement. I know that's moving quickly. Have a look at O'Mealy's case to give some idea of the uh, difference between making a statement under a duty or pursuant to a duty and in the, merely in the course of their duties. Another one is dying declarations. Funny one, dying declarations. Uh, the law assumes, and it's been, it's been the law for, for a long time, that a person um, who makes a statement as they're about to die is telling the truth because that's, you know, what have they got to lose? But I, I, I have trouble with it. Um, you know, just because a person is hopelessly doomed to death does not, in my view, suddenly make a person who has been a habitual liar all their lives suddenly completely truthfully uh, truthful. That They might have a, a 
a whole range of reasons not to be truthful, even though they're about to die. Anyway, but it is the law. So that is an exception to the hearsay rule that a dying declaration um, made by a victim who's in a settled, hopeless expectation of death is evidence as to the identity of an assailant or any other circumstances of, of uh, the death. So there are other exceptions to the hearsay rule, statements in public documents, statements concerning the maker's contemporaneous physical condition, evidence at a committal hearing, previous trial of the accused or a previous civil case between the parties, all res geste. I'll just, I'll just break that down for a moment. So for example, you're in a trial situation, someone has given evidence and you know that is completely different to the evidence that they gave at a committal. It's not hearsay to refer to the statements that were made by the person during the committal, even though they were at an earlier stage. Part of the reason for that is that uh, they were given under oath if they were given at the committal. Likewise, a previous trial. Um, Queensland Evidence Act, have a look at the provisions relating to documentary evidence. And in particular, have a look at sections 92 that relates to civil documentation and 93 that relates to criminal documentation. We talked about that last week, so I won't go into that any further, but just bear in mind that they are exceptions to the hearsay rule as they relate to documents under the Queensland Evidence Act. Once again, um, at the Commonwealth level, the starting point is always section 59 when it comes to the hearsay rule. Section 60 provides for exceptions, but there are a whole range of exceptions. And the easy way to look at that is to consider the chart. I know I've mentioned this a few times, but it's a really handy checklist. Um, and that is have a look at the flow chart which you'll find in the Commonwealth Evidence Act. And it provides a whole range of different exceptions that might apply. Um, so specific exceptions to the hearsay rule at the Commonwealth level are mentioned in section 59, subsection three of the act. And you'll see they're actually listed there. Okay. So, um, evidence relevant for a non-hearsay purpose, which is what we've been talking about in section 60 um, and so on. So down the list. Okay, you've been very patient. Um, it's probably a bit more than we I, I should cover, but I think that'll do us for this evening. So what do we take from tonight? Tonight we take this, that there are a number of exceptions to the hearsay rule but you need to be very clear about what is the hearsay rule before you can consider what are the exceptions. That you should develop for yourself a flow chart or a list that provides a statement of the hearsay rule and then a statement of the various exceptions to the hearsay rule and have one good authority under each one of those headings that you can rely upon in an examination situation or better still, in court. Next week, we're dealing with issues to do with circumstantial evidence. So we're moving a little away from the hearsay situation. Any questions? You've been very good. No, Samantha, no, Vivian? Okay. All right. Um, we'll see you next week. And thank you for joining us. Bye then.